Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, and a warm welcome to all of you joining us here today at uh, Campus Biotech or online via the Zoom webinar or the live stream. We have uh, he, uh, approximately an hour, 30 minutes uh, questions and uh, 30 minutes presentation, which uh, will start uh, with our four uh, speakers today. Our chairman, the chairman of JESDA, Peter Brabeck Letmat, our vice chairman, Patrick Ebischer, our board member, George Wan Tan, and Nanjira Sambuli, who's a member of our a a diplomacy forum and also a uh, policy analyst and strategist. I'm Marie Hood, I'm the director, corporate affairs at, uh, at JESDA. And after, um, so after the question, the, the presentations, we will be uh, having Q and A's. You online, you can of course uh, also ask your questions. We will relaying, be relaying them to uh, our panelists and speakers. In the in the front row, joining us uh, today as well, we have uh, Mr. Guillaume Pictet, who is uh, the president, vice president of the Fondation pour Genève. Uh, Alexandre Fazel, Swiss Ambassador, representative for uh, science and diplomacy. Michael Muller, who is uh, the chairman of our diplomacy forum. Stéphane de Couter, the, our secretary general. Jeremy Farrar, director of the Wellcome Trust and the board member as well of, uh, of JESDA. And we have also Martin Muller, uh, director of our academic forum and Olivier de Cibo, who is uh, the curator of the JESDA Summit and our director of communication and science uh, outreach. So I'd like now to give the floor to Peter for the introductory comments. Thank you very much, Marieke. Uh, dear members of the press in Geneva and online, uh, dear friends of JESDA, on behalf of the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, JESDA for short, I'm pleased to welcome you today to our first press conference. It's the first outing of our newly created foundation. So 24 months ago, the founders at the origin of our foundation, which are the Swiss and the Geneva governments, along with the authorities of the city of Geneva, entrusted us with a concrete mission. That was to develop an instrument of anticipation and action in service of humanity in order to widen the circle of beneficiaries of advances in science and technology all over the world. And at the same time, to strengthen Geneva as a preeminent hub for multilateralism. Accelerating the use of opportunities that advanced scientific exploration bring to the world seems straightforward. However, and on the contrary, as we have learned during those two years, it is quite difficult. Firstly, and thanks to our scientific forum, which is co-headed by Joel Meso from ETH Zürich and Martin Wetterli from EPFL Lausanne, we had to access, we had to scout and discover what is already cooking in all laboratories of this world. And secondly, we confronted this knowledge with our diplomacy forum, which is headed by Michael Muller, former director general of the UN office in Geneva, in order to better understand the political and social implications those scientific breakthroughs will have to confront when they are ready to be applied in our daily life. In accordance with our mission, we have in fact developed as a first step two complementary instruments. First, an anticipatory instrument, which is the Shesta Science Breakthrough Radar, and you will hear a lot about this, in our next presentations. And the radar offers an open source overview of the scientific disruptions in the making 
that will unfold their effect in a five, 10, and 25 years period. More than 4,000 scientists have been contacted to give us their input. And the document is signed by 543 scientists from around the world. It presents 260 disruptions that will very quickly impact all of our lives. Wherever we live, whatever our age or gender, in the digital domain, in the field of health, in the field of the environment and science diplomacy. Secondly, an instrument for action, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit, which will bring together 900 participants from today to Saturday here at Campus Biotech and Friday evening at the Peace Campus including 108 speakers from 32 countries. With this summit, the foundation is opening a global consultation with political authorities, diplomats, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, NGOs, and citizens, so that together from 16 of the scientific disruptions which we have selected out of the radar 2021, they can work out solutions, initiatives, and projects that benefit everyone in the world and contribute to the achievement of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. The first concrete solutions, which will be developed after the summit and based on the input from the summit, will then be presented in the second edition of the RADA and the summit. Both are scheduled to take place in Geneva from 29th to 31st August 2022. But as of today, we are very pleased to present the first edition of the Shesta 2021 Science Breakthrough RADA to the public for the first time. It is being developed in close partnership with the Fondation Pour Genève, represented here by Mr. Guillaume Piquet, and in close collaboration with a large number of partners. One of them is the X Prize Foundation, whose CEO, Anoushe Shasari, is a member of the Shesta Diplomacy Forum. X Prize is going to set up its offices in Geneva here at Campus Biotech. We are working together to launch a joint public competition to develop quantum applications in collaboration with the World Food Program, the UN Habitat, and the World Health Organization. Its general manager, Amir Banifatemi, is already with us this morning and will be participating in our activities on during the summit. Let me conclude by underlining a meta fact. The speed of scientific and technological development is accelerating even further than what it already is. And it plays an even greater role in our daily life. In order to fully take advantage of these advancements, we need to coordinate the complex relationships and interactions between scientists, politicians, citizens, and entrepreneurs whose agendas, mindsets, experiences, and responsibilities are all very, very different. Geneva, with its UN international organization, universities, scientific organizations, and NGOs, is the ideal place to develop scientific diplomacy based on anticipation and participation by all. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Geneva. Welcome to the first Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit. And as our slogan says, and let's all together use the future to build a better present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. We will now show you a short video that explains everything about the radar. We've been using this term a lot. And uh, we hope these four minutes should make it all clear for you. Thank you. 
Patrick, Pro Professor Ebischer, I think on, as uh, the vice chairman of JESDA, but also as a scientist, you wanted to share a few comments on uh, the radar as a tool. Okay, thank you, Marike. Uh, maybe just a couple of comments. Just you saw this uh, little film that tried to tell you to capture. It's not that easy because uh, let me remind you two things. One, what do we do? That, what do we did this is that you know we all see that there's a phenomenal acceleration of science uh, today. So as a scientist, we tend to know quite well our own field, but which is very limited. But we don't necessarily have a real understanding of the breadth of what is going in science. So you have specialized the societies and so on. It is very difficult to have, a, say, a holistic view of the cutting edge part of science. Uh, and I think this is a new uh, concept to some extent, is to do a radar. A radar, and that to do this, we've asked you know, some of the uh, top scientist scholars to try to tell us, and this is maybe very unusual, to see where they would see their field going in 5, 10, and 25 years. As scientists, we tend to guess what we want at least to do in three to five years. That is the typical granting period uh, when you ask for, for, for funding. We are much less comfortable at 10, and we're very uncomfortable, let's say, at 25. And, and this is you know, pushing us to some extent out of our comfort zone to try. However, who are the best people to tell you where things might go are still probably the leading, the top leading scientists in their own field. And that was really the whole uh, idea behind. And to do this, you know, we've contacted some of our colleagues with the help of the uh, board who we believe in the top university worldwide are the people, let's say, that could tell us where quantum computing is going. I think just to give you this example, I think it's quite fascinating. I think we start to capture what quantum computing could do at five. But, you know, we could do a lot of like everything in science. There are great benefits, but also potential issues. If you look at another field, which is my own in neuroscience, it's obviously, you know, that, they are, that we start to have tools that could have a major impact like memory or cognitive enhancement, Brain machine interface, can you read these other people's brain? Radical life extension. Those things need to be discussed. And I think that's the whole idea of GESDA, is to bring the policymakers and the public in general to see how we want to handle those discoveries. How do we want to develop them to make them available to them as many people as we like to, you know, so that everybody can benefit, but maybe also think that we should not do with the kind of thing. But I think us as scientists, we're just there as an honest broker to say, this is what is, you know, doing, uh, that are, what is cooking in laboratory. That's where we could go in 5, 10, or 25. I think that's really, uh, I would say, the, the very original part of it. To some extent, it's the raw material for, a, it's a kind of a new instrument for multi, multilateralism. And I think we're better to do this than in this place. Let's say there's some areas of science that you think could be problematic. You have WIPO just next door that could tell you if you could patent or not. If you could patent or not, it will have a huge impact on its potential applications or not. Again, this is the place to do it. And symbolically, you are here in the campus biotech with a very strong area for neuroscience at the heart of the international science. So it just also tells you that probably science needs to be at the table. For now, we have been too much probably in our own laboratory. So that I think we want to share this knowledge, you know, as an honest broker with the diplomats, with the policymakers, but also to the general public so that, you know, we can drive or frame things for a positive benefit of mankind. Now we've chosen, I will not go into the detail, but you see there's advanced AI four fields, Advanced AI and quantum computing, human augmentation, with probably at initially a very strong emphasis on neurotechnologies because we believe that they are really affecting potentially who we are. Eco regeneration and geoengineering, things like decarbonation, climate control, space resources. And last but not least, very important, science and diplomacy. Can you know science bring something to some extent to diplomacy and digitalization of conflicts, complex system for social immigration? You name it. But this is the first attempt. I'm quite, and this is done under, uh, which is also very important, an open interactive digital platform. So I can only encourage you 
This is just a better version. We just put it now two days ago online. It will be improved. We will get more scientists to get and to participate. But this is, a, I would say, a first attempt, the first instrument for uh, this new multilateralism that we believe is very important because science needs to be part of the equation. And I think we want not to keep it for us, but now to open up and specifically to policymakers so that we can, you know, conduct and frame the technologies that we're going to live with tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Sambouli, you've been following this process as well, but from the diplomacy angle as part of our diplomacy forum, would you like to share some of your comments as well? Thank you, Marieke. Um, obviously, this is the last quiet time of life we'll know. So the, the pace we are going 5, 10, 25 years, as you're saying, is only going to get more and more disruptive. So what do we do about it, really, I think is the question before us. And I, I reflect on this question thinking from the perspective of emerging and developing markets as well. Um, so we do need a place, um, if you will, to describe the coming developments in science and technology and a neutral place to have serious discussions about what we need to do as a global community to ensure that these developments lead to positive outcomes for humanity. I hope you can hear me, by the way. Okay. Hey, <laughs> made a case in point. <laughs> Noted, case in point, we're living through what we need as new technologies to address very unique challenges we have as humans. <laughs> so the Science Breakthrough Radar really is a tool or a tool being presented at this JESDA Science and Diplomacy Anticipation Summit as that place to host these discussions and, have, and, and really lead us towards concerted action accompanying these forthcoming science advances. As has been described, is an open and freely accessible digital platform to facilitate inter, um, ac, uh, conversations and interactions with all interested parties. I think the really interesting thing here is that it's not just a conversation between scientists, which is one part of it, but really bringing the policymakers, the diplomats, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, civil society leaders, and the general public. I hope that especially for younger people, this will be a place that they really gear towards because these are the, this is the future they're going to be living in. And wherever they are involved in those sectors of society or new sectors that they will be defining in the age that we're moving towards, that they would be involved in these kinds of conversations to see how they can benefit humanity as a whole. The inaugural edition of a science breakthrough radar is extending science anticipation, but also considering the current debates in society. It's complemented by a section where eight leading uh, scholars from philosophy, the humanities and the arts are assessing how the science breakthroughs will, will and are already shaping the way we see ourselves, relate to each other and care for our environment. There's a chapter on debates which examines why these topics are addressed by JESDA and why they matter. They provide a synthesis on the debates in society on the current challenges facing humanity. It also contains what is called the pulse of society, which is scanning what people all over the world are saying on social media in relation to the themes addressed by JASDA. I imagine that really leads to fascinating insights. Uh, the radar is, is also aiming to encourage reflection on what might emerge so that we can discuss this uh, openly. We can analyze and debate this by, uh, as citizens of, across the globe with, with our different opinions, our sentiments, our values and worldviews according to our cultural, geographical, generational, or economic backgrounds. Um, another chapter is on opportunities, which aims to answer the question, what can we do with science anticipation? And indeed, much of the summit is going to be about that. This gives an insight into the global challenges, such as the sustainable development goals, geopolitical issues, and societal implications linked to these specific breakthroughs. Now, the radar and the summit are providing us with an opportunity to genuinely and rigorous, rigorously look at potential opportunities and policy options, as well as future initiatives. The radar is serving as an initial tool with the goal of creating a joint language and starting the broader societal and political debate around these emerging topics in relation to fundamental and existential questions. The summit represents the anticipatory situation room where these discussions will take place, ultimately leading to identifying collective pathways for action. 
So that G- Just the Science Breakthrough Radar welcomes further dialogue and broader engagements with the communities and aims to be an honest broker between disciplines, communities, regions, and worldviews. The open plenary at the summit, which I will moderate this afternoon, is therefore a key moment to kickstart the discussion and broader engagement process in order to jointly design solutions to some of the largest challenges that will affect and are affecting humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Samboli. I'd like now to turn to you, Professor Tan, as Chief Health Scientist of Singapore and member of the board of JESTA. Can you share uh, your perspective on science diplomacy? Seen from, seen from the Asia-Pacific region, we've seen quite different approaches to the pandemic, for example. But... Good morning. I, there are several aspects of uh, JESTA which I think are very unique and very exciting. Uh, today, in the interest of time, I'll just talk about three of them. The first, I am very, very excited about the fact that the science engagement is very global. And we are seeing in the last two decades uh, very substantial science and technology strengths developing across Asia. And scientists, research communities in Asia are willing and able to contribute to a process like the one that's being developed here. And this also allows JESTA, therefore, to tap onto some of the best talent and research expertise on relevant fields from around the world. So I think that is that inclusive approach is very important and impressive. The second very distinctive feature, I think, is uh, as scientists, we are very rightly excited by the opportunities, by the benefits that can come from research. But we also should be very mindful of the potential shortcomings, the tripwires, and potential problems that can be associated with research. For example, if we think about the area of human genetics, which is going to become increasingly important, more than three quarters of the whole genome sequencing of humans uh, is um, from Caucasian individuals and societies, and less than a quarter is from the rest of the world. And if we started to develop solutions, technical solutions based on a limited, more limited data set, then we will find that the lack of representativeness of the data sets can lead to unintended biases, flaws, and uh, technical problems. So this attention, not just to the benefits and upsides of science and technology, but also some of the problems that could be associated with the application of research, I think is very important. And it's a uh, very a uh, unique part of the JESTA effort. The third reason why I'm so excited about this effort is because it also takes into account the different social, cultural, and uh, political contexts in different parts of the world. If we uh, think about the COVID-19 pandemic, those of us from East Asia, like China, Hong Kong, Singapore, our reference epidemic is SARS, of 2003. And so we think about not just the scientists, the policymakers, but the society thinks that the virus, the transmission can be virtually eliminated and our approaches are as such. Whereas for much of the rest of the world, the reference pandemic is influenza, where elimination is not really possible. So we are in a world where there are different perspectives, different approaches to tackling common global problems. And you do need a forum that is able to bring together the different perspectives, different voices, and to think about what are the best ways to bring together solutions. In the case of COVID-19, it will be not SARS or flu, but SARS and flu plus something else. So I think that in summary, the JESTA uh, approach, I think is very exciting because it's systematic yet it is uh, inclusive and global. And we do need a systematic approach because we are dealing with highly complicated problems. It is also open, amenable to opinions from different perspectives, but it's structured. And again, you need that structure because uh, the complexity otherwise will make it very difficult. And what we do hope is that through this inclusive, structured, systematic approach, 
that will be able then to find, to accelerate uh, science advances over the many valleys that would hinder its development, and particularly the valleys that may hinder its uh, access and the benefits it can bring to communities all around the world uh, so that we can all benefit from the fruits of science. So there are many reasons, but I thought I'll just share these ones which are particularly striking. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now uh, get back to Switzerland and we will show you the welcome address, the video welcome address that will be uh, broadcasted this afternoon at our opening plenary, the opening plenary of the JESDA Summit. So it's a, it's a preview for you this morning. Dear Mr. Peter Brabeck, Chairman of the JESDA Foundation, Dear Ms. Natalie Fontane, Honorable State Councillor of Geneva, dear members of the board, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Swiss government, I want to extend to all of you, near or far, in person or online, a warm welcome to Switzerland. My government and the local authorities of Geneva created the Gesta Foundation two years ago. We felt, as the host state of one of the foremost centers of global governance and as a major global player in science and innovation, that there is an urgent need to fully capture what science and technology have to offer in terms of foresight, understanding and solutions. The phenomenon of uh, the convergence of sciences is expanding the field of scientific discovery and accelerating technological progress. This will change the face of humanity and hence change the way humanity is governed globally. Through the best possible interaction between science and diplomacy, we must acquire the ability to anticipate new technological challenges in order to design appropriate solutions and to turn new technologies into opportunities for each and every one of us. Moreover, geopolitical considerations come into play around science and technology. There is a growing feeling that a new Cold War is about to be fought over science and technology and the power they confer to the states, they master them. We must, therefore, reflect on how we can adapt, evolve and respond to the challenges and opportunities of our time. We need to build the global governance of the 21st century, which can only succeed if it is far-sighted, evidence-based and equitable. In this spirit, JESDA is designed as a new tool in the service of effective multilateralism as a resource we wish to offer to the legitimate actors of international governance. The method is based on anticipation. The international community should be offered a good understanding of the challenges and opportunities ahead. The breakthrough radar you are about to discover certainly does that. The method is also based on participation and geared towards impact. JESDA facilitates, as an honest broker, the conversation between multiple stakeholders in order to build convergence around concrete solutions to practical problems. What we are trying to achieve with JESDA is new and hence difficult. To link anticipation that looks far ahead with action that is immediate is a major challenge in itself. And the method by which we are attempting to do it is new and challenging for the participating scientists, diplomats, policymakers, citizens, and representatives of the private sector and of philanthropy. But personally, I haven't seen any better proposal yet on how to use science diplomacy to make governance of world's affairs fit for the reality we are going to face. With JESDA, we are creating an instrument that is based in and operates out of Geneva. But the aspiration is universal. We are working for the global commons here in Geneva and 
through the content and methodology we are proposing whenever and wherever the conversation is taking place. Thank you so much for your presence, interest and participation. Let's set out together on the journey of anticipatory science diplomacy. Mr. Brabeck, would you like to give the final comments? Well, thank you very much. Well, I hope that uh, those different presentations, which gave you also different focus on scientific side, from the diplomatic side, from, I would say, our founder side, which is uh, the Swiss government and the Geneva government and the city of Geneva, what they expect from Chester. I hope this has allowed you to have a better feeling of what CHEST is all about and what are the first results that CHEST can present to you. My takeaway is very clearly, we are Geneva-based for all the good reasons that Patrick was mentioning, that uh, Nasio Cassis was mentioning, uh, but we are for working for a global common good. So, Yes, Geneva-based, but our aspiration is worldwide. Otherwise, Shesta would not fulfill its uh, task. It is definitely science-based, uh, science, uh, science but it takes into consideration immediately what uh, John was saying, that uh, in science, there are positive and negative things. It always depends. And uh, we have to talk and to be transparent about this in order to concentrate and to limit uh, that science to the positive one and eliminate as much as possible the negative ones. Uh, I mean, there are many issues where science need, and they want, by the way, from what we have heard from our scientists, they have uh, the need to have a framework within which they can develop their creativity. There are uh, the geopolitical considerations which were mentioned by the minister. Well, there is a new trend for using science and technology as a kind of neocolonialism that uh, breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs, are kept in the hands either of some very few powerful states and then afterwards being used as a colonial weapon, or it will, which is even worse, if it is kept in the hands of two or three big private corporations. So I think there are a lot of positive and negative things, and it is up to Shesta to help, to not only identify this, but to create a framework in our confrontation between science and diplomacy, to create the framework which is, allows a positive development and accelerate the development of those scientific breakthroughs for the common good of all people of the world, and not only, as I said, for some privileged ones. So this is a little bit the way we, we see our task. Uh, perhaps one thing I wanted to mention at the end, what Chester is not. Chester is not a political institution. Chester is not a think tank uh, which is being created by some uh, multinational corporations. Chester is not at the service exclusively of one country or one government. We want to be a very honest transparency broker between science on the one side and diplomacy and politics on the other side. That's what we want to be. And for that, we are relatively a small team. If you think that in two years with this magnificent team that we have of only 10 people, we have been able to create something like this scientific uh, science break Surara or this new summit here. I think the future of Shesta will be on this level. It will be limited to about 20, 30 people, not more, because the executions 
of the solutions that we might identify together with your help after the summit and uh, the breakthrough radar and the summit is an ongoing, it's a rolling uh, event. Those things will be then afterwards given to other people in order to implement it. It will not be Chester. Chester will not become a great international organization with hundreds of people and administration and bureaucracy. That's not. We want to be a small, honest, independent broker between science and uh, diplomacy and policy. Thank you very much. And now I think we're open for questions. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I am in the back here. Sorry, I, I'll stand up so that you can see me. Um, my name is Jamie Keaton. You'll get the you'll get it, Boris. Don't worry. Um, the um, uh, my name is Jamie Keaton. I'm Associated Press uh, reporter here in Geneva. Um, I have two questions. Um, Mr. Brabeck, uh, particularly leaning on what you just mentioned, you mentioned about having uh, a small staff. Um, I, I think that the question, having written about this um, in April when I first found out about JESDA, um, I. Uh, I came to the idea that you're talking about a small number of people that are going to be working here that are taking on some very, very big ideas, very big projects, very vast. So I'm just wondering how do you, for, for some people who think that, you know, you've got these big futuristic sort of ambitions, there's also a reality. In, and, and so how, how do you address the, the, the pitfall, the, the prospect that you may have sort of a funnel problem where you get so much information that, can't fit through the, the funnel. Okay, that's my first question. That's kind of a broad question. My second one um, has to do with, um, you mentioned also about um, not being um, um, uh, limited to governments or, or, or not be, um, uh, you mentioned neo-colonialism, you mentioned um, that you know, private sector um, shouldn't have too much control. I'd really like to try to drill down on that, particularly with a specific example that we have now with COVID-19, with COVID-19, because we have seen if you could just address the lessons that um, that we can have learned from COVID-19, in particular, when we see that a lot of uh, critics, including the World Health Organization in this very city, have said that um, big pharma is not doing enough. They're striking too many um, uh, bilateral deals with countries. Countries are hoarding um, vaccine. What kind of things can you have derived from those lessons that could possibly um, and that JESDA could help possibly uh, prevent in the future. Thank you. I think uh, Patrick wants to say about the first one. The second one would be good. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I don't know if it's 10, it's 20, or it's 50, but certainly the idea is not to build, you know, hundreds of people to do the, the radar. I think the radar is really, the science breakthrough radar will really be at the core of what GESDA do, because that's the raw material to discuss. Now, it's not 10 or 20 or 50 people that do it. It's a community of scientists. You know, I'm amazed to see, to build this, that we had 500 top leading scientists engaging their time to do this. This is quite remarkable. You know, the word of science does not work necessarily like some other part of society, which is primarily motivated by financial return. It's really by sharing data, by peer recognition, by wanting to contribute. So I think you have, you shouldn't say because we're 20, we're gonna, it's a huge no. The idea is to get the data we need from the scientist, okay? So if you're talking about science, guess that probably just on the radar will be several hundreds, if not thousands of people working. But they're working just to understand for free because they, we as scientists are very, engage and think this is the time to engage with society as a whole. So I think that's the, the core of the philosophy. And maybe the other thing, which is very important, it's going to be a rolling system. So what you're seeing is a better version, but I think we will enrich it, you know, with scientists from all over the world. It's a platform. And the idea is to have, like you have the WEF, the IMD that have their own ranking of things, the radar will be a, a, a continuous, but a rolling with once a year summit because science moves fast. What we think could happen now may be disrupted next year. So that's the idea is to keep, is to give this raw material again to society to try to create this new multilateralism. That's at the core of it. 
I think for the second question, I think Jeremy will be the best uh, suited to answer. Hi, uh, thank, thanks for the question, Jeremy Farrer from um, Welcome and Chair of the WHO Research and Development Blueprint uh, Group. Um, so, so I think your, your, in a sense, your second question sort of um, underlines the importance, at least to me, of why contributing to guests is so important. So, so take the COVID situation we're now in. Um, science has moved forward phenomenally in a year. Um, but I'm afraid, and I speak as a scientist, scientists did not think through the consequences of the problems that would come down the track in terms of inequality. Um, inequality of access to vaccines, global distribution of manufacturing, elements of society that would not be willing to accept the trust in authority or the trust in government, the undermining of government institutions and public authorities. So the science made enormous progress, as it's doing in the scientific that Patrick was just talking about. But if you don't put that in the context of society, if you don't put that in the context of politics, and you can't avoid politics and diplomacy, then that scientific advances will increasingly be available to a small elite in the world and not to everybody. And to me, that is the greatest challenge of the 21st century. How do we avoid that degree of inequity in the world? Whether we're talking about climate inequity, we're talking about inequity in terms of energy access, water access, access to science and technology. And if we're not careful, there'll be a small group of countries or individuals in the world with access to the best science, and it won't be accessible to everybody else. And unless that's addressed politically and diplomatically, uh, we won't make the advances that humanity needs. And obviously, we've only got a small planet. And the second is there is, I think, an increasing distance. I maybe th and driving the, the, the advances in populism globally, which is putting a distance between society, politics, and scientific advances. And if we don't bridge that, then I think we will end up in a very inequitable world. And inequitable worlds are very tense worlds, and ultimately in history have mostly led to conflict. Good morning. Uh, this is Ricardo Bagnato on Swiss Public Television. Um, just one question. Uh, Mr. Burbeck, you said what, what JESTA is not. So let's try to say what it is. And here's a, an option. Uh, during the last two years, uh, we've seen so many task forces within all countries uh, against COVID, whatever. Politics asked scientists to lead the rational against the irrational politics sometimes they have to deal with the irrational of the population so are you planning to become the task force of the government of the world of the governance of the world and if so if it's not to exaggerate uh, if it's so are you dealing with the united nations to become such a part of it and is it not just that nowadays a little bit too swiss centered thank you I will ask uh, our chairman of the Diplomacy Forum, Michael Muller, to answer this question. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Uh, the short answer to your question is yes. We are engaging very closely with the, uh, the whole United Nations family, not just the sort of political aspect of it in the Secretary General's office in New York, but every single technical uh, organization, both here in Geneva and elsewhere. We have spoken to the heads of practically every single UN organization, and not a single one of them has declined to participate in one way or the other with uh, with JESDA. Some of them personally and very uh, physically, if you want, and you'll see them in the next few days uh, participating in meetings, sitting in uh, in conversations, um, and are, in, are an incredibly important uh, partner in what we're trying to do, particularly when we get to the solution phase where uh, if we're going to make sure that the um, ethical aspect of what we're coming up with, or the governance aspect, and the equity aspects are taken care of in the best possible way, we need to partner with the United Nations and all its different actors, uh, also to make sure that access at the, at, the, at the country level, where at the end of the day, it, this is where it's important, how are we going to impact the lives and improve the lives of individuals across the world? they are going to be indispensable partners in doing so. So the conversations uh, are constant and, and, and deepening, and the partnerships from the sector generally all the way down to uh, 
um, to uh, to every single organization, and not just at the head level, but also at the very much at the operation level, is uh, is part of what we do every day. Thank you. Now I just read a couple questions uh, uh, that are coming online. Uh, Laurent Siero from the news uh, Swiss news agency is asking. What achievements would you like to have achieved as JESDA in the same time frames as the radar, 5, 10, 25 years? Do you think there might be a fully AI membership of the board in 25 years? How are the P5 countries reacting to the JESDA initiative? Um, well, let me try to reflect on what has been, been said up to now. Uh, there was this question about how can you pretend with 20 people or 30 people to achieve what you want to achieve, which is a global challenge, which has not been tackled up to now by nobody. And the answer I think you received uh, through both the, uh, Patrick and, and Michael, that the 20 or 30 people are not the one who are doing the work. The work is being done on a voluntary basis by thousands, thousands of scientists and thousands of diplomats in the world all over. They make the work. And it is strength because they make the work. It's a strength of Shesta. And this is the main reason why looking forward to this uh, five years or 10, and I don't dare to look more forward for the time being, because we still need to get the agreement from our founders for the next five and 10 years. But for the next five and 10 years, voluntarily and on purpose, I think Shesta should not become much more than what it is, because we will not be able to incentivize all these thousands of people all over the world, which we need, if they feel that what they are doing is not exclusively for them and for their cause, but it's for an institution or for a company or for a government. I think the most, the biggest challenge that Chester has is to keep the enthusiasm of all participants all over the world to participate in this challenge, which has as an objective, like it was said by Jeremy Farrar, the objective is that we make these scientific breakthroughs available to everyone in this world, and that it is not the scientific breakthroughs finally, as was mentioned before, or could become a geopolitical weapon. And it is a basis, it could become basis for populism, which we have seen. And this is the big challenge. And this can only be achieved by an honest broker who is not dependent on anybody, but to the one cause. So that's what I see for Chester. We, we have another question actually on the honest broker online, um, honest broker concept. JEDA has described itself as an honest broker of information and more of an incubator of new projects than a project manager. But will it ever advocate for a position or take sides on something? Advocate for a position or take sides on something? The, the idea is not to take side necessarily. The idea is to be this honest broker. That's at the heart of what we do. The heart of what we do is to say, this is what we anticipate is coming from laboratories of the world. We're trying to take people, you know, from the diplomacy and political, but also the general public to know to which extent they want this for the future of our species and our planet. We are the go-between. We're just there to tell you what we think is coming, and we try to put the people together to decide. When I don't think that we can take side. In science, we have to be this honest broker to say exactly where science is and where it's going. 
and what you want to do with it. Now, we could stimulate, but through this debate, initiatives that could come out. I think we're in this very unique town of Geneva, and we're at the heart of the international community. Maybe you need different organizations to tackle some of the issues that are going to be made. You know, we're talking, should science be policed to some extent down the road? You know, should you have an original code of science? If you do create a quantum computing, should you create a CERN of quantum computing so that computing techn- you know, quantum technology can be accessible to the general public? Those are initiative, but certainly we will not, we're not there to take side. We're just there as this fundamental role of being an honest broker between the scientific community and the policymakers as an overall, as an overall uh, you know, entity. Thank you. Stéphane Bissard, Le Temps Newspaper. Um, just that consists of ident- ident- identifying uh, scientific breakthroughs in the labs or across the world. It's also to ant- consist of anticipating the impact it might have on society. I, I have a question about the next phase. Uh, what are the necessary ingredients uh, to integrate these findings into workable solutions to solve the great challenges that we are facing? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in my short introduction, the summit is the first step to confront the scientific breakthroughs which are in the radar, some of them, which we have selected. I mean, there are 216 in there. We have selected 16 out of them for the discussion and the summit. And during the summit, everybody will participate in thinking about what are the opportunities and the limitations for solutions. That's exactly the objective of the summit. And after the summit, as we have also this open, freely available digital platform, we will confront this with everybody in the world who wants and get the feedback. And on those, we will work and come back to you in August 2022, which we hope is perhaps two or three solutions that we could bring forward. So the solutions could be like uh, Patrick was saying, perhaps a a quantum CERN in Geneva could be in order to assure that the outcome of quantum development is really available to everybody in the world and not in the hand of four countries and three companies, okay? So this could be one, but there are many other things. We don't know by now because it will depend on on the feedback that we are becoming, that we are getting now. Uh, during the summit. And the, after the summit, we will continue the confrontation that we have between the scientific uh, forum with the diplomacy forum. We already had two confrontations during the last years, which, which have helped us in order to work on the, on the, on the, break, on the breaks for ARA. So next year, we will have a, set, a, a new break Sorara, which will be the next uh, version of it. But that will have perhaps similar uh, objects in there, but there will be new ones coming up because we think we will be scouting out new things that might happen in one year. A lot is happening on the, on, on, on in the scientific world. But we will also enlarge the radar now with the input that we are receiving, and we will be able to bring forward in the radar, in certain cases, already solutions. That's basically the way, and though it will go year after year. Thank you. There's, I'll take one last question, except if there's more. Yeah. Hello, Felicinotti from Swiss TV, um, German-speaking part. 
Um, I'm wondering, um, you're setting up this um, anticipation um, exchange between science and diplomacy. Um, you want to make them talk together. In the past, we've seen that what um, uh, concerns, for example, the development of internet and its le um, défi for the democracy. Um, it has been, uh, or behind that were the big tech uh, companies. So um, how will you face that challenge to integrate also this part? Because um, companies have often more means to get the scientists to work for them than public institutions, and they will probably be not as um, open to sharing their knowledge as maybe scientists, even though you can also ask that question for states, how much will they be open to share their knowledge actually? So how do you plan to integrate that part, the concurrence of uh, private companies? I think this is a favorite subject uh, for Patrick. <laughs> I think this is the perfect example, you know, we wouldn't have social networks is on if a couple of physicists decided in this city to create, you know, to share, to share the data at the CERN and they create the web. Now we didn't anticipate at the time the power and what you could probably do it. And to some extent, you know, retrospectively, we should have anticipated and maybe set up regulations, frame the utilization of the internet. Now you could say it's a daunting task. But I think that's exactly what, you know, Jesda should do. We're having now things that are as, if not more disruptive than the web was. And I think that's the whole purpose is to get, and who developed it? It's not that you could say it's always the companies. As an academic, let's say, I have a lot of great respect for companies, <laughs> but it's rare that the real true disruption happened in companies. There are a couple of exceptions. Today in AI, it's true that the GAFA, the GAHAFA have hired in their institution people from the academic, and they're about the only one that can afford this kind of long-term research. At the time before, the Bell Labs were a bit the same thing before the whole thing was disrupted. But the great majority of the true disruption comes from the top academic institution. Just in terms of money power that goes into research, there's much more that goes to the public sector than in the private. Sometimes people in terms of the very early disruption, because that's the whole purpose of academia. And I think that's really what you need to do. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't bring the, the companies together very early on. But to give you this example, we have now one of the top scholars that has given input into the quantum computing is somebody who is the head of, of quantum at Microsoft, but there was before a professor at ETH Zurich. He was probably one of the most, you know, uh, uh, participating member because he realized that needs needs to be done despite you are in the company. So I think that, you know, you need is not one versus the other. You need to bring all the scientists that are at the heart and really anticipate. So to, the, to some extent, what happened here in this town, you know, which was, you know, fantastic in terms of discovery, you know, just came out of a curiosity research uh, you know, but maybe not frame as it should have been, doesn't happen with the kind of technology that are being developed today in laboratories around the world. I have a minute question. Was the scene when I was with on the mic recorded? And if so, can I get a copy? It's been, it's been recorded. It's been also live streamed on uh, YouTube. You'll find it on YouTube as well. But we can send you the link. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for to all of you, those who joined us at Campus Biotech and those who joined us uh, online as well. Thank you uh, very much. For for what about your image and your honor?